How do you tune a 4160 600 CFM Holley carburetor when it has no secondary jets? Easy. Just install a jet plate. Hey guys, you know the story. I'm Richard Holdner. I'm at West Tech Performance and I'm testing, guess what? No, not another LS. This time I'm testing a small block forward and I'm very excited for two reasons. One, I get to test a vacuum secondary 4160 carburetor, kind of a low buck deal. And I've always had problems getting these vacuum secondary carburetors to actually make power and get them to dial in, especially on the 4160. It has no secondary metering plate, so it makes it difficult to tune. But I also got to work with my good buddy, Steve Brule, AKA the Cart Whisperer. And we put this 4160 on this small block Ford. And with his help, we were able to tune the heck out of it. So check it out. The 302 test motor featured a rebuilt stock bottom end, blueprint aluminum ported heads, a YN Stealth intake manifold, MSD distributor, and inch and three quarter dyno headers. Okay, guys, let's jump right in on our carb tuning session that I did with Steve Brule on the 4160, the 1850 600 CFM vacuum secondary Holly. And so we're going to start off with the air fuel curves, and I'll show you the associated changes with power, with power. But really, we were trying to dial in the air fuel on this thing. And what we did is we tried running it right out of the box, but it was way, way too lean on this combination. So we had already changed to basically uh, 70 primary jets up from the 65s that originally came with this carburetor. And we had this kind of curve. So we're looking at a load in of 13, drops down to 11.5, and then gets back up into 13.4. Uh, so it's really on the lean side in a couple of spots, leaner than we would want to run it. Here's what happened. Here's an interesting thing. And it's, it's important to note that on this run, we had wired the secondaries so that they would open, that we weren't using the vacuum secondary operation because it still had the factory spring in it. So what we did was wire them open. The secondaries were opening all the way. And this is the kind of air fuel curve that we got. Here's what happened when we disconnected <laughs> our wired secondary opening with the factory spring, the secondaries really didn't even open. It was very, very rich because you had a really big signal drawing through the primary circuitry of the carburetor. And as you'll see, we lost a lot of power having the secondaries not open, but we had a big change in air fuel <laughs> that was much, much richer, but we didn't lose power because it was richer. We lost power because the secondaries weren't opening. And here's what happened when we finally put the light, I think it was a white spring on our combination. Let's see number four. And see, once we did that, we actually got to the point where we could get the secondaries open. And oddly enough, compared to wiring it open, I'll go ahead and label these, you can see, but when we allowed the carburetor to function as it's supposed to, and, and, and the way that it does on a chassis down or, or out driving around with the secondaries opening um, against the spring, the thing was actually leaner, is up in the 14s. Uh, you saw here, it started out at 13.9, but and dipped down to 12.5, which is fine there, but then leaned back out to 14.0, uh, finally dipping down to 13.5 or 13.6. So still way too lean in a lot of spots, but let's take a look here, and I'm gonna show you the associated power curves. So this is our power curve starting out with the wired, with the secondaries wired open. Here's what happened <laughs> when the secondaries didn't open up, power dropped, you know, from 365 down to 300 because we were only breathing through the uh, primary circuit. And then here's what happened when we put in the light spring and got the secondaries to open. We got close to what the original power output was with the, when they were wired. Now we didn't, I, did, I should have used the carb cam here to find out if they were actually opening all the way, which I don't think that they were, but we made a little bit less power with the vacuum secondary operation rather than just wiring them open and making it a mechanical secondary opening. But this is what happened in our initial round of testing. Uh 
beer are you going on this? Okay. Which is really unusual for this size car. Yeah. You know, something you know, like a 68, 70, you know, 600, probably like 66, 72, something yeah. like that's kind of normal. So I don't have yeah, a smaller carburetor, it should uh, want less jet. Yeah. It should have a lot more signal. I, I, exactly. Yeah. And so I don't have a great answer other than I'm not really familiar with this carburetor. Um, it's something that we don't use much, you know, it, because it is small yeah. and it is so vacuum secondary streetable. Yeah. I'm going to show you the part number on this. I just went and, and photographed it. These might be dual quad carbs oh. or, or um, I don't think they're blower carbs, but dual quad carbs. Yeah, see, I thought, what is an 1850? Uh, those were the, those were the old 600 CFM 3995. That's both yeah. gaskets from Super Shop, right? Those are back in the day. Yeah, these are, unless this is just an updated part number of that carburetor because now it's shiny and has more zinc in it or something. It's not yeah. dichromate. Yeah, the 1850s were all dichromate color. Or, or, yeah. Those are the ones that you could get in the back in the day in the summit, the PAW catalogs. Yeah, they, they were literally, I remember at Super Shops, they would be stacked in piles half the size of this room, just yeah. stacked up, hundreds of them, for every local guy around that oh, yeah. had a 307 Nova. <laughs> nice. All the best ones had 307s in a red. All the best ones. Yeah. Okay, we have our Holly carburetor, and so far we have put a lighter spring in it for the vacuum secondary, and we put um, 70 primary jets in it, but it actually does need more fuel. So at this point, what we did was put a jet plate in it, which means that we, we changed the secondary metering plate from the factory one that was non-adjustable, and we installed an adjustable jet plate that allowed us to put you know adjustable jets in just like the primary side. And so what we did was put this in, and in measuring the flow orifice, for the factory jet plate, we assumed or, or calculated that, that this would be about the equivalent of 65 or 66 jets. So what we did was put, we kept our 70s in the primary, put 70, 70s in the secondary jet plate after installing the jet plate. And we thought that that would actually richen this thing up and give us more fuel that we wanted to. And here's what happened when we did that. Unfortunately, I'll go ahead and label these. It got leaner, which means that we went the wrong direction. And, or actually, we measured the flow orifice of the original factory secondary jet plate. Um, we, we were wrong in our calculations. The jet size was actually larger than that, but it was an easy fix. All we had to do was add more jet. So here's what happened. We added more jet. We went from our 70s to 76s all the way around. And we, we richened it up. So now it was still, still a little on the lean side. It was still 13.4 and 13.4 basically. So what, what we needed now was even more jetting, but easily solved now that we had secondary and primary jets that we could adjust. So what we did was throw some more jet at it. And then I'm going to go ahead and move myself up here out of the way. And then we finally got on this on the on the lower curve here. We finally started out on the roll in 12.8. It dipped down to 11.6, leaned back out up to 12.8, and kind of ended out here in in the low to mid 12s, 12.3 or so. So with 80 jets in this thing, we finally had this thing working. And what I'll do is I'll go ahead and show you what happened on the power on all of these. This is our original jet plate. I'll go ahead and move myself down here. This was our first shot when it was too lean. We made less power. This is when we added the 76 jets. Power was back up and maybe gained a little bit. And this is what happened when we put the 80 jets in it. What we did was rev it out also. I kind of wanted to see where this thing would kind of stop making power. And you could see the power curve is falling off out there with the, this, this particular camshaft that we have in here. But uh, the 
power change isn't very dramatic when we went from our, you know, when we're, we're balancing around with our 70, 76, and 80, C, and 80 jets, the power curve didn't change dramatically. But what did is the air fuel and the safety margin, and that's very, very important. We weren't really looking for power. We did get some power gain. Obviously, when it was too lean and we gave it fuel, it made more power. But after we got into a realistic area in the 13 to 1 to 12 to 1 range, or even down in the 11 5 range, in that range, we didn't see a dramatic change change in power, but it meant the motor would actually last when we were making full throttle runs. Okay, we've taken a look at what happens when we change the air fuel with jetting. You saw that we had made a bunch of runs. We changed the spring. We changed the jet plate. We changed the jetting. We did a lot of tuning on it to see if we could get the air fuel curve, you know, at least safe. And you saw that on some of the tests. We weren't looking really to make power because in some instances going from 13 and a half to 12 and a half to one doesn't show a big change in power. We're not doing it. We're not trying to tune extra power out of it. But if we run the thing at 13 and a half to one for or 14 to 1 at any length of time, you could damage things. And that's really the thing. If you can bring the air fuel down into the 12s, you're not, you're may not make any more power, but you certainly would make the thing safer. And really that's a critical thing. You want the motor to last. So even if you're not looking at more power by putting more jet in it, you're looking at more longevity and that's every bit as important. But now let's take a look and see what happened when we, when we change the jetting. So what I like to do whenever I'm tuning anything, whether it's fuel injected or carbureted, is we want to make sure that the air fuel is safe first. And we always start off with low timing. In this case, we've kept this thing at about 30 degrees or so of timing. And then we adjusted all the air fuel and then we stepped up to timing. And so we ran this thing with 30 degrees of timing. And with that timing level, this was a locked out distributor. This is on 91 pump gas. It made 368 horsepower and 356 foot pounds of torque. Yep, and here's what happened when we added more timing to it. We went up to about 33 degrees and you can see it picked up power everywhere. So it did like the timing. 378 horsepower, peak torque checked in at 364 foot-pounds of torque. And then here's what happened when we went up even further, because I know everybody's thinking, oh no, a, a small block forward chamber wants more, more timing, wants more power. It'll make more power with more timing. Here's what happened when we went up to 35 degrees. We did pick up a little bit more. It's up over 380 horsepower, 382 382, 83 horsepower. Peak torque didn't really change very much. 365 foot-pounds of torque. And we got to change the power a little bit down low, but not dramatic. And this is what happens when you change timing. You step up from a lower timing level to a higher timing level, and you get a good gain. And as you keep going up in timing, the gains that you get diminish. So you'll get, you'll get fewer and fewer gains, and pretty soon you won't gain anything. And if you keep going, you'll actually start losing power. So this seemed to be where this thing wanted you know, the timing. And I, I'd like to take this opportunity, thank my buddy, Steve Relay for helping out with the, with a carburetor. He's obviously very good at him, but it was good to be able to film somebody else doing the work on this 4160 carburetor on this, you know, fairly inexpensive 1850 Holley carburetor. I'm Richard Holder. Please make sure, like, share, subscribe, ring the bell, do all that stuff. I'll keep testing.